me on behalf of in half uh, welcome you all and thank you so much for this uh, encouragement uh, when, when this whole idea came up uh, from kitty ji uh, definitely we were already in the middle of covid and uh, middle of all kind of avalanches of webinars and uh, but we didn't had any doubt that uh, we will be able to re rethink uh, the way we are and the way uh, our habitats had been and uh, as uh, as in half which is like forum of almost uh, 50 urban professionals civil society and development agencies which are really uh, really thriving trying to do something uh, in in the in making our habitats both urban and rural better uh, there was maybe a great opportunity to first to initiate and think about maybe like a, a series of about 30 webinars but now we have already extended that uh, in in by november and now as we are rethinking our cities uh, about 150 180 experts specialists planners uh, economists uh, development thinkers and most importantly young professionals would have to really now uh, shape and reshape and rethink uh, whole urban spaces which has been given to them as as a reality uh, is been part of this uh, this journey uh, this web series is an integral part of something called the citizen urban initiative of inhab which uh, kitty likes to definitely call a uh, situ uh, and it's all about a multi level multidisciplinary uh, social effort uh, which is really spearheaded by some of the india's leading urban uh, professionals and and practitioners uh, we know already that uh, we are uh, in a very complex urban uh, ecosystem which has its own challenges and we also know that uh, there is extra pressure on on city just not to be produced uh, like productive effective sustainable or livable but at the same time we have the challenges of uh, really uh, first of all sustaining our cities uh, and like thinking or rethinking about cities is really trying to repair an aircraft which is already in the flight. And, uh, but still, I think uh, what, what gives us really hope to do and uh, reimagine and rethink cities is also our own context. And uh, in the own context, our works uh, as practitioners and people who are concerned about cities has been really giving to ourselves in terms of that mandate. And uh, urban, uh, our urban development in general is definitely a national development challenge, but in very recent years, we had been uh, looking at it, and maybe last three decades or so, uh, we are looking at urban as even a challenge. Uh, our, our even perception of India as a, as a India lives in village to India living in cities is yet to be uh, established as a fact. And I think we all know that uh, we didn't need actually COVID to, to have this kind of realization that what kind of pressures we are putting on our urban systems. Uh, but it also kind of opened up, uh, definitely exposed our, our, our systems, our, our ecosystems related to not only ecology, but social, economic, and also particularly the health sector uh, impact which uh, COVID had on us. And maybe environmental sanitation, water sanitation, our challenges, sustainable mobility, we all, uh, could get like a pause to really think through during our COVID that how do we really reshape? Although we were all busy in doing uh, our own bits of work for rehabilitation and rescue and uh, the what could be a very sad example than, uh, than migrant labor really using the most sustainable mode of transport of walking back to thousand kilometers. It was really heartbreaking to even see that. And some of these frustrations, some of these anxiety, as well as uh, helplessness was also expressed throughout these, uh, the series. Uh, I, I, I just came from a very interesting conversation with uh, Pune Municipal Corporation Accounts Department. And uh, uh, what, I, what is very interesting to learn that uh, what city was able to spend as, as recovery is maybe 20% of its total capacity uh, like if the municipal corporation spends about 1200 crores a year uh, the re rescue or all kind of uh, retrofitting activities for dealing with covid is about 300 to 500 crores uh, in just about a few months and that has maybe helped strengthen the the health departments uh, within within municipal corporation uh, that made me also think that if you're looking at if the climate change is on the door and knocking it will we have the same level of uh, trust in the scientific data like COVID is real 
and climate change being a slow disaster, would we have a similar kind of a will to uh, to really stop uh, our cities or, or, or all kind of developments in order to also deal with uh, staying below 350, uh, below 350 uh, carbon, uh, let's say, particles in, in our air? Uh, that's surely an unanswered kind of a question. And as we are moving towards 2050 and around 480 million people staying in cities, it it's really remain, uh, remains a really interesting challenge for, for all of us. Uh, what this series has really um, bringing to not only uh, to INHAF, but it's right, really like a co-creation between INHAF, its partner, as well wishes, is really uh, a moving towards a co-creation, which is really economically productive, socially just, uh, politically participatory, and environmentally sustainable uh, and culturally vibrant cities. And this vision cannot be uh, actually done and manufactured at one institution and organization. So that's why it is like a potentially a network of network, which is really moving in that kind of a direction. And we are really uh, happy that we are partly able to uh, first uh, initiate this thinking at the same time uh, uh, really, now it is no no more uh, an activity, but it can potentially uh, take forward a shape uh, which we really could be uh, contributing and also reshaping uh, our imaginations. Surely, uh, in our own cities, in our own uh, in our own uh, what what to say the uh, Kurukshetras or what you call the uh, wherever we are working is is a, a, in in our. Uh, I really also admire here in the, in the last word, not because KPG is part of an app or is part of several other institutions. Every change needs a driver and he had been a driver of driver to really uh, run behind all of us to really drive it. His enthusiasm is really amazing. And I, I really uh, feel that with his experience and with uh, with strong support of all the partners who had been supporting this webinar, we will be definitely able to uh, take forward uh, a new urban agenda in future. Uh, with this, uh, I stop here. And Anand, sir, wonderful to see you here. And, and over to you, sir. Uh, taking the cue from what uh, Avinash just mentioned, uh, hi, uh, I am Harshal Suresh. I'll be just uh, sharing my uh, presentation, uh, uh, a sort of uh, in alignment with the concept of uh, rethinking cities, which uh, Avinash had mentioned. Uh, Raja has uh, recently come out with this uh, Urban Governance Index 2020 uh, as recently as uh, uh, the first week of uh, uh, December and uh, very much in alignment with what uh, uh, Avinash uh, had mentioned about rethinking cities. This is an uh, index which uh, sort of uh, uh, tries to assess uh, the extent of decentralization of powers from the state government to the city government. So in the next uh, uh, 10 minutes, I will just give you a brief background of what this index is about. Uh, how did we come to uh, preparing this index? And uh, what are the very uh, key, uh, 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 key data points that come out of it uh, in relevance to today's uh, 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 theme, which is the role of executive and uh, 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 the elected? And uh, uh, give you an overall uh, picture of what the index has uh, found out. So, uh, I'll straight away play a video uh, on why this index was uh, made and what was the need for it. Harshil, please share your computer's audio. Right. Uh, I'll just do that. In the last 30 years, India has witnessed rapid urbanization. In 1911, the share of urban population in India was merely 10.29%. It took more than 100 years for this share to grow to 34% by 2018. But by 2050, 
it is estimated to grow to 50% or more. Evidently, India's urban population and urban areas are seeing an exponential rise. The economic growth of the country in the last few decades has caused its urban areas to attract millions of Indians in search for better opportunities. City infrastructures are not being able to cope with the demands of such mass migration. Today, many urban issues such as flooding of cities during heavy rains, spread of infectious diseases, unending traffic, sewage and waste management, lack of basic amenities such as drinking water, healthcare and so on are crying for attention. Recognizing this problem, in 1993, the 74th Constitutional Amendment Act was enacted to strengthen urban local governance. It directed the states to devolve 18 functions that would be better performed at the local level to the city governments. Unfortunately, only a few states have done a partial devolution and most of the state governments have been reluctant in transferring these 18 functions. As a result, India is one of the least administratively decentralized nations in the world. Many schemes have been introduced by the central government in the recent past, such as Jawaharlal Nehru Urban Renewal Mission, Smart Cities Mission, Amrut, Swachh Bharat, and so on. Some of the cities, owing to the state political will, have been able to harness these for betterment of urban areas, but even so, Indian cities seem to lack in livability standards compared to other metropolises in the world. Praja with its work and experience in urban governance, decided to find answers to this problem. Praja decided to map the urban governance structures and practices across all states in India. Having spent three years visiting different cities across all states in India and having studied their urban governance architecture and practices, Praja was able to understand the root causes of the problem. The 74th Amendment and various schemes launched by the center to revitalize urban India have not worked. Praja realized that the existing structures of governance would not be able to implement the 74th Amendment and the central government schemes. What we require to implement these efficiently is empowered grassroots democracy. This is the heart of the matter and to advocate and achieve this, Praja has developed the Urban Governance Index. The Urban Governance Index will rank all states in India across different themes while highlighting their governance journey and best practices. This will enable other states to draw inspiration, learn and implement similar practices. It will be a unique tool to facilitate advocacy, planning and citizen participation. Indian states need to commit to making cities more democratic, empowered and accountable. Only then can cities fulfill the aspirations of our citizens. In 2023, India will complete 75 years as an independent republic. Let us recommit ourselves to further strengthening our democracy by empowering grassroots institutions. The Urban Governance Index will help states pave a roadmap towards effective city governance. Uh, so just to reiterate uh, certain points that the video mentioned, uh, the main principle uh, on which the Urban Governance Index is developed is uh, to sort of create pathways towards achieving true democratic empowerment of uh, city governments and also to ensure accountability of city governments towards citizens uh, through bringing in citizen engagement. Uh, the work, uh, 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 the work span of building this index are uh, uh, span from right from 2017. Uh, over the last three years, we have been uh, uh, conducting a detailed urban governance reform study across 40 cities in 28 states and uh, the National Capital Territory of Delhi. The study involved one-to-one uh, -one interviews with uh, a range of stakeholders uh, from uh, elected representatives to civil society to administration. Uh, apart from these interviews, we also had 20 state level consultations, one regional consultation and a national level consultation. Uh, the urban governance index is uh, mainly a ranking of uh, a state level ranking uh, uh, in which one uh, best in class uh, representative city has been taken from each state. And so uh, it is an, a state level ranking across 29 cities uh, 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 in 28 states and the national capital country of Delhi. Uh, as I said, uh, the UGI uh, uh, helps to uh, assess uh, uh, the extent of decentralization 
from the state government to the city government and uh, uh, with that with the with that background i would like to give you some uh, key data or uh, key insights that are coming out of this index uh, mainly on uh, uh, points of uh, citizen engagement uh, 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 mayoral system the councillors mm -hmm. and the city administration uh, when we talk about uh, citizen engagement or uh, empowering citizens uh, there are certain key data points that has come out of the index like uh, there are only three cities out of the 29 cities that we studied which have functional ward or area surplus and these cities are aizawal dharamshal and gangtok uh, when we talk about ward or wards committee you have only nine cities out of the 29 cities which have a functional ward or wards committee the cities are uh, ahmedabad aizawal agartala delhi dharamshala imphal kochi and mumbai uh, city governments of only three cities uh, have established open data portal or uh, have some sort of open data sets in their uh, uh, website uh, respective city government websites uh, these cities are bhubaneswar mumbai and raipur uh, city governments of only four cities out of the 29 that we study namely panaji uh, 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 ahmedabad mumbai and bhubaneswar have minutes of the meetings of uh, council or the committee uh, bodies published on their respective website uh, moving on to uh, the mayoral system uh, only seven states that is arunachal uh, sorry seven states which is arunachal pradesh delhi goa gujarat himachal pradesh karnataka and maharashtra do not have uh, 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 the mayor term uh, is not uh, coterminous with the term of the city government uh, in states except chatisgarh manipur tripura and west bengal mayor does not have authority to appoint the chairperson of the standing or subject committees uh, in 15 states there is no apex committee uh, uh, like system which is uh, so to say mayor and council system or uh, uh, or having a steering committee system which is uh, there in uh, prevalent in kerala uh, so uh, 15 states do not have such a system uh, states namely uh, chatisgarh haryana jharkhand uttar pradesh and uttarakhand have a directly uh, elected mayoral system uh only kerala has a provision for mayor to write an acr which is the annual confidential report over the commissioner but uh, the mayor does not have the authority to appoint or terminate the commissioner and this is uh, uh, this is the same elsewhere across the country uh but uh, on the particular aspect of acr it is only the kerala mayor uh, the mayors in kerala which have the power uh, power to do this uh and this uh, provision has been given in the municipal act and uh, talking about uh, uh, councillors one uh, uh, main highlight which i want to bring is that only in 13 states councillor receive a, a fixed salary or remuneration uh, so to say uh, uh finally on to city administration uh, you have uh, city administration of only four states which is goa tamil nadu uttar pradesh uttarakhand which have authority for sanctioning recruitments uh mizoram and west bengal have provisions for an autonomous body to conduct recruitments uh in mizoram you have the uh, mizoram common cadre authority uh in uh west bengal you have the west bengal municipal service commission uh apart from this municipal acts of jharkhand and tripura has made provision specifically in their municipal acts for conducting trainings uh for uh, the municipal officials uh lastly talking about uh the 18 functions that have been mentioned in the 12th schedule of the 74th constitution amendment act uh, none uh, none of the states have completely devolved all the 18 functions uh to the uh, uh, uh under the complete uh, control of the city governments uh just to give you as i said uh, the urban governance index is a state level ranking and just to give you the overall uh, uh sort of uh, picture as where do the states stand uh, you have the top 5 states which is odisha maharashtra chatisgarh kerala and madhya pradesh uh, which are in the top 5 and in the bottom 5 you have jharkhand arunachal pradesh meghalaya manipur and nagaland now what is interesting to note here is that uh if you look at the top 5 states uh you know the score ranges from 45 to 56 percentage uh which is uh 
an average performance uh, 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 overall on a scale of 100. Uh, now, this is substantiated in this slide where you can see uh, a table on your leftmost side where uh, you have states uh, uh, across uh, mentioned in columns, and then you have indicators, which are 42 indicators in total uh, in this index, which are uh, mentioned in the, uh, uh, in the rows. Now, what you'll observe here is in the table across that you see these red cells across, which means that across states and uh, states across these indicators have achieved lower score, uh, 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 mostly. So uh, that itself explains that there is a lot of work to be done as far as urban go governance reforms are concerned, and uh, there is a lot of gap that needs to be fixed. Uh, with that, I will end my presentation. Uh, I hand over to uh, Anand sir. I hope the uh, uh, the panelists take in some uh, data <coughs> from here and connect with their experience and uh, uh, share from it. Um, thank you, Herschel. Uh, there are actually two or three questions for, uh, and, and those questions are largely around uh, the kind of data and facts and the assertions that are made in the report. Uh, but I think we can come to that later, or maybe you can actually respond to them in the sure. chat in, in the text itself. That might save us some time. Um, <clears throat> thank you, everyone. Um, my job actually is a fairly uh, decently and fairly narrowly cut cut out uh, task. The panel today is, uh, like I'm sure it was yesterday's, um, had the simple job of um, trying to give us a diagnosis of what's wrong with our cities and give us some kind of a prescription. Um, it sounds very simple when I say it, uh, but what we have here on the panel is a number of people who have a lot of um, work experience and a lot of uh, political experience and administrative experience. And therefore, um, I'm hoping really that, that we will be um, able to hear some very interesting perspectives on this. Um, I want to very quickly frame a set of questions um, that might be useful uh, to, to reflect on as we go along, um, even though each of the speakers will be speaking from their experience and therefore um, maybe responding to some of these questions only at a tangent, but, but, that, but that's fine. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I was actually thinking about as Herschel was presenting this is, is this very important question that we all need to reflect on. Um, is, is democracy a value in itself? We want democracy for itself uh, because it's good to be democratic, or is democracy an instrument for growth, for development, for better livability of the cities? And I say that this is important for us to think about um, because part of the implicit diagnosis in the Praja report and the, and, and the index is that. Um, one of the reasons why our cities are not doing very well is that they are not fundamentally democratic. We haven't figured out how to institutionally solve this problem of democracy and of inclusion. And if we do that, then we will probably be able to do a lot of things much better. It may be true, it may not be true, uh, but I think it's really important for us to reflect on uh, in what ways is it true and in what ways is it not really true, right? Um, I mean, for example, is it perfectly possible for a dictatorship to produce really functioning, uh, fantastic cities that are very, very livable, but people can be terribly unhappy living in those cities, right? What do, what do, what, what do these things really mean? Um, <clears throat> I think in, in responding to this problem of the diagnosis and, and the prescription, we will definitely come across a number of positions that people will willy-nilly be taking, and one of them is the specificity of each of our cities. And this is because um, our cities are deeply embedded in agrarian regions and interlands, which are all around them. I mean, because cities are what they are because of their connections. Calcutta is what it is because of East India Company's history, uh, because of its port. Mumbai is what it is because of its manufacturing industry that developed in the 19th century. Um, Chennai is what it is, and Delhi is what it is, and Hyderabad and Bangalore are what they are precisely because of those histories and historical trajectories. That doesn't mean that there's nothing that our cities can learn from each other, 
but it definitely means that the specific directions that each of these cities will take, the permutations and combinations of the flaws in our cities um, emerge because of those kinds of histories. Right? Patna is what it is with all of the reforms that are adopted or not adopted precisely because of that, that specificity of that history. And I'm sure that all of us are deeply aware of the fact that the reason why the state governments hold so much power over cities is precisely because cities are so very important as engines of growth for, as, as centers of power and command for the region. You know, state governments really cannot afford to give up that control over cities because if you do that, then you lose control over the entire region. It's a very, very deeply political problem. And I think that the problem actually began to emerge in the late 60s in our country, not really because of, of, of any, in, any change in the constitution, but because of changes in our political culture. And that's something that we have seen very repeatedly because until 1968, 69, many of our cities actually did have very functional and very, very, very robust municipal governance systems. People were actually sitting down and talking about what needs to be done for the cities. The second set of issues I think that emerges from this is this whole problem of how autonomous are our cities and how autonomous can our cities really be, right? Anything that is important to think about the possibility of autonomy to start with, <clears throat> because to begin with, our cities are not cities that can constitute themselves. You know, in the US, it is possible for a city to declare itself a city by a resolution. We don't have a situation of that kind here. We have to be certified as a city or an urban by the state government. And this is because of, of the, again, the history and the logic of, of, of governing a national territory that has a, has a certain kind of colonial past. And within this, very often what we find is that national government, state government, and local politics, all of them clash with each other in our cities. In some cases, you will find, for example, you go to Chennai, northern part of the Chennai is a very, very strongly dominated by local politics, whereas the rest of the city is not like that. In Hyderabad, you would have the, the southern part of the city very strongly dominated by local interest. The rest of it is not. There you will find that national political parties, you will find that regional political parties, they're all fighting for turf. How do we deal with these kinds of problems is another big issue. The, the, the third very important issue, which keeps coming up in all of our discussions, which is finances. Where do cities actually get their money from? Um, I mean, the constitution does definitely provide for, for cities to get money from through, through recommendations of finance commissions, state finance commissions. And most of the time we know that it doesn't really work very well. And there is a limit to how much we can milk cities for, uh, for, for, for property tax. And therefore, the only resource that cities have at any given point of time being land, that is where you will have a huge amount of conflict emerging because the only way in which cities can actually raise finance ultimately turns out to be the money that can be raised through monetizing land. And this is, this is one of the things that often comes up when we begin to think about slums and what do we do with our slums. Maybe one way to actually achieve slum-free cities is to banish slums completely out of the city and throw them out of the city. So that the city that, that, that is going to be the engine of growth will have no slums at all within that jurisdiction. And in many ways, that kind of club type of urban governance systems have emerged in many places. And we need to think about what these, might, these things kind of might be. I think one very important question that comes out of all of this <clears throat> is, are we really expecting too much from our cities? I mean, are, we, are, we, are, we, are we trying to squeeze out too much from uh, the urban um, where it is actually not capable of delivering so much? Is it possible? And I, it may have, again, something to do with the fact that we are a post-colonial uh, country which is trying always to be caught, you know, caught in this game of catching up with something or the other, um, we, are not, uh, uh, see, we, 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 we are not cities that are uh, capable of commanding regional economies outside of national territories, however much we want to. 
that finally brings us to this question of what is the institutional arrangement within the uh, municipality? How do we really think about what our municipalities are doing um, to the relationships between the elected representatives and the, the line departments actually pan out very well? And these are things on which uh, the, the experience of our, of our uh, panelists today is going to be very useful. Um, did do mayors uh, manage to uh, get uh, what they want on behalf of people? In what domains are they able to do that? In what domains are they not able to do that? And those are things, again, on which it will be really great to hear some reflection from the panelists. So with that, I'm going to, to, to hand over now uh, this to the to the uh, sequence of panelists. We are going to start with uh, Pushpavalli Ma'am from, from uh, Mysore. She is the um, ex-mayor of, of, uh, um, of, of, of uh, Mysore. Um, and, and then we will move on to uh, Bikash Ranjan Bhattacharyaji, who is the, who is the, the, the mayor of uh, Calcutta at one time and now is a Rajya Sabha member. Um, and at some point of time along the way, we will have uh, Vikram Kapoor sir, who is the additional chief secretary from, from Tamil Nadu will also be joining us. So um, with that, I'm going to be handing this over to Pushpavli ma'am. Ma'am, will you come online? Yes, sir, I'm online. Yeah. Welcome everybody. So, Can you so hear me? Yes, uh, yes we can everybody. hear you, ma'am. I Pushpavali from Mysore. Uh, I've been uh, elected in 2001 as a corporator and uh, I became the uh, deputy mayor. That time I was, uh, hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, that time directly I came to this uh, political life. Uh, and then first I got some problem, but uh, after the intervention of other agents like uh, uh, Urban Develop uh, Urban Research Center, we got training and we stopped reacting. So that I we came to know what is 74th Amendment, what are the war committees, and uh, what is uh, what is budget mainly we need the budget. So in 74th Amendment. Uh, we came some uh, across some uh, this one like fire service, forest and transport, which are not under our, under local bodies control, and they are the main revenue of the um, revenue package. So if that comes to our uh, organization, so it will be, be more economically strong. Uh, and then there is no ward committee still now in my city. Uh, that is the main link uh, between the offices and the public that has been not constituted in Mysore, uh, and then. Uh, I think the mayor election should be direct election and should and they should have some executive powers so that they can control and they can execute their powers without powers sitting just like a rubber stamp it is not uh, worth I think so and then uh, uh, that then the term if the direct election automatically term will be extended to five years I think that should be done and then um, the candidate should must must be knowledgeable. As my experience, the candidate should be must uh, be knowledgeable. The party which gave ticket to the candidate, they should see whether she can manage or he can manage and they should be knowledgeable because of the reservation. If the mayor is elected, mayor is elected with the knowledgeable, she can or he can manage. Otherwise, it will she will be a dummy and she will be a puppet in the puppet in the hands of men. I think so. She should be knowledgeable, or he should be knowledgeable. Candidate must be knowledgeable, and then the now we are having fifty percent reservation in local urban local bodies. So I think knowledgeable persons or a woman elected representative comes, she can work easily. Otherwise, she will be a puppet. Once again, I repeat that. And then elected body should not violate the rules. Uh, for example. If uh, the officers come to the areas to collect the tax, no, we should not interfere because these are the main sources, taxes, water tax, and then uh, trade license, then the other taxes are the main sources for our uh, corporation. 
uh, this elected representative should not interfere for the collections of the taxes, taxes and MLA and MPs also should not interfere in the local matters. Uh, if local bodies are working in some ways, the MLA will interfere or the MP will interfere, they will disturb for the development of the work. That should not be done in my experience. Uh, now it is a you know, oh, that is a very real uh, is a, should uh, have, uh, have facing many problems in health. Like uh, they should they are not getting the tax properly. They are not getting any revenues. They can't concentrate on the health problems in the cities. So I think the state should provide more fund to the local bodies to maintain the health of the public. Uh, and then the main thing I concentrate is the budget. As my experience, uh, first year when we entered the corporation, uh, we didn't know what is the budget. Just we thought they will give one book and we will go through it. But we didn't know how to participate in that. Uh, in my experience, when we got the training from the other agents like urban research centers and there are many like women power centers other uh, organization selected some uh, candidates and they gave started giving the training in the budget and other things when the when we go through the budget books no we came to know there are many allocations for the women in that uh, when they women they were not used only they were just uh, the amount was like that only so we started asking why the amount is like this only? We are not. You are not used. They were telling you are all silent. You women are silent. We can't allocate for anything. If you raise your voice, we can allocate. From that time, we started raising our voice, and then we started giving some schemes like Tyler machine, and then put for the pregnant ladies, and then training in the computers. Other things we started. So we need the budget, and then elected representative should should have training in the beginning itself. Otherwise, we will be a uh, nothing. Yes, we will be a rubber stamp in that uh, organization. So I tell my opinion is that every elected representative should have training in this uh, uh, line. Then uh, uh, again, if you go through the administration, office must promptly collect the taxes without any intervention or any without any this one they should go for the taxes if they come in the area if we tell uh, in uh, i'll tell in kannada you know kadame madappa tax if we tell means that is if you make some uh, reasonable for that fellow means they will collect some bribe and they will if there is one lakh rupees of the taxes will come for 10 or 20 thousand i don't know why how we will calculate so that should not mm -hmm. be done the officers should be prompt and we should explain everything to the elected bodies. This is so and that is so. If we do that, no, we will continue to tell him like that only. That will suppress the income of the uh, corporation. Then uh, officers appointed in the corporation or in the local body, you should have some uh, uh, proper uh, designation. For example, in Mysore City, the zone officer, he has appointed uh, as a veterinary doctor, he is sitting as an AC, assistant uh, uh, commissioner in the zone office. He, what he knows about the civil and what he knows about the health of the human being, he doesn't know anything. He is a veterinary doctor. No officers, we made him to sit in the uh, AC as an uh, assistant commissioner in the zone office. So that is the main problem we are facing. Then in this uh, corruption, in this COVID time, the new sh new scheme should be adopted in the local systems, like uh, giving some uh, sanitizers, masks to the below poverty line people, and then the school. That's all the main thing in we are facing. And we are telling them to allocate this in the budget. <clears throat> Office But the officer vision of the scheme. If they are sitting in the same place, no, they will start doing 
in corruptions. Uh, as we faced, one officer is in Mysore. He's still in, still sitting from five years. From five years, he's not been transferred because he's having a higher political influence. He is doing everything, whatever he wants, he is doing. Nobody is there to question it is. I don't know why. Because during our period, when we were mayor and we were uh, corporators, we used to rise over voice. But nowadays, the corporators and the elected bodies are silent. I, I don't know why they are silent and what is the system they are facing and what is the problem with the state and the local, bo local bodies. Uh, with my experience, I tell, and as a woman representative, we should have knowledge and we should have control over the administration. Otherwise, we could not, we can't uh, do any work. And then as a elected body, we should sometimes we should face the problems like uh, house problem, personal problems. And then we should go through the, the what dropout children also. Sometimes we used to go for police stations also for the uh, our voters like that so i think uh, this is enough because for a long time i'm sitting with you and my experience was uh, so far 2001 now what the elected bodies having experience is null i think so null they should have training and the knowledgeable uh, elected representative should, should come and uh, this system should be changed i think so i think this is this i'll i'll end my presentation thank you very much thank you very much ma'am that was very very useful um, many of the things that that you spoke about are, are resonate so well with the experience of people everywhere um, so um, let's let's move on to the next presentation and then we'll take questions all of them at the end uh, at one go um, <clears throat> so shall we move on to uh, Bikash da um, Vikash Ranjan Bhattacharya was, was the mayor of Calcutta and is, is now a, a Rajya Sabha member and has a long um, experience of, of urban politics. So, uh, Vikarta, will you, will you uh, step in now? Yes, yes. No problem. Thank you. So, you see, at uh, the very outset, I must say that the presentation given by the Praja is really reflects the genuine parameters of the difficulty in our governance. We must keep it in mind that the urban cities cannot be governed, dehorts the governance of the entire country. The governance of the entire country, as I have already expressed my opinion, is based on the Indian constitution, which is the mother law. Now the constitution has given these urban bodies as a third tier government. And if it is a third tier government, then they should function like an independent government within the parameters of the law and the areas fixed by the constitution of India. The whole difficulty which I feel is that we have not yet developed the democratic temperament, number one. Number two, the government at every tier, maybe at the first tier, the second tier, they are also not very comfortable with the this. If the power is decentralized, both politically, administratively, and financially, which was the basic purpose of amendment of the Constitution of India, if it is done in the proper spirit, I think that the urban governance will improve. And the urban bodies, they have also some sort of apathy with regard to the democratic decentralized governance. You will find, which is my experience, that these urban bodies also do not constitute the ward committees. That is the unit of democratic governance at the grassroots level. If these ward committees are constituted and the programs which are to be implemented are discussed, I don't think there would be any difficulty in which are pro-people. Because the programs which should be implemented by the urban bodies have nothing to do with politics. These are not the political issues. 
these are basic issues of development which has already been fixed pre-fixed agenda by the statute that everybody knows that what are the areas of function in which the urban body has to discharge his obligation and while doing so if the ward committees are constituted the proper representation of different section which which was expected to be implemented are made then the programs with regard to the public health programs with regard to the primary education programs with regard to the basic environmental issues open defecation environment each can be implemented with the aid of overall and the macro policy decision of the center which are really needs to be executed by the urban bodies and i believe the parameters which have been very rightly been pointed out by the uh, team which had worked on vyapa praja is really talking of lack of democratic governance and lack of decentralized governance we can do small structure and thing body are body also we have a cabinet form so that is and the thank you to come radhika can you check with him on the phone oh, yes i am on that uh, in the meanwhile please continue the conversation yeah <clears throat> um hachil do you want to quickly respond to some of the questions and comments on your on, on uh, what with with your presentation was anand sir vikram sir is also here yeah perfect yeah so uh, i think uh, some of the larger questions were around uh, uh, the uh, choosing of cities uh, in the uh, 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 the selection of cities in our uh, urban governance index but before i come to that i would just like to make a, a point that the uh, index uh, mainly is composed of uh, four uh, main themes one is the city elected representatives in the legislative structure which is uh, the mayor uh, the councilor and the council uh, the second is uh, city administration the third is uh, on empowered citizens and uh, lastly we have a, a theme which focuses on uh, fiscal empowerment and this these four themes are further divided into 13 sub themes and then you have 42 indicators now uh, as far as the selection of cities is concerned uh, uh, of course uh, we have a lot of variation as far as the state municipal acts is concerned uh, in each state uh, you uh, there is a lot of variation uh, there are instances where uh, there are municipal uh, uh, acts for a specific uh, uh, municipal corporation Uh, in uh, states, uh, in uh, some states, you have municipal acts for nagar panchayats and uh, councils. Uh, uh, Tamil Nadu is a special case, as I mentioned in the Q and A, that uh, where you have a total of fifteen uh, state municipal act. So uh, that is a special case in itself, where I think uh, a further study and further uh, detailed study will uh, need to take place as far as. Uh, 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 further uh, uh, insights uh, to be taken out. Uh, uh, so that's the, uh, given the variation in the state municipal act, and given the number of cities that we are looking at, uh, including nagar panchayat corporations, councils, uh, and also with the size and scale of the project of uh, covering the, uh, 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 given that it's a national level study, uh, we uh, came down to the fact that we will be choosing uh, one. Uh, 
Western class representative city, whether it's a capital city or a second largest city from uh, each state for the studies. And that's how we came down to it. But uh, the UGI can be uh, further modified uh, for a detailed state level study. So as I said, uh, if we want uh, to apply the same index framework for Tamil Nadu, uh, we can do a, a detailed study on Tamil Nadu with uh, taking in uh, Nagar Panchayats Council and the corporation and doing a deeper uh, dive and uh, getting some really interesting insights onto it. But uh, right now, the uh, index that we have published is a, a state level ra ranking at, at a national level that is across uh, the 28 states and the national territory of Delhi. Uh, so I hope that answers. Yes. yes. Yeah, more or less. Um, Radhika, should we wait for Bikash Ranjanda for a little bit longer? Uh, or... I don't think so, sir. He's trying to connect, but there are some troubles in his network. He said he'll try okay. to join later towards the end, okay. maybe. So uh -huh. we'll wait for him. But uh, I guess we should continue the conversation uh, for now. Okay. So in that case, uh, should we move on to uh, Mr. Vikram Kapoor? Um, sir, welcome. Um, um, to give you a very quick uh, summary, uh, are you able to hear us? Yeah, I can. Thank you. Okay. So to give you a quick summary of what happened until now, um, we had a presentation, uh, started with a presentation from Praja on their Urban Governance Index, which essentially takes one uh, best-in-class city from each of the states and um, creates an index uh, and some sort of a ranking that emerges from that index on the, the uh, depth of reforms that have been undertaken in urban governance in each of these cities. Um, and we had another presentation from uh, um, from the ex-mayor of uh, Mysore uh, city, Pushpavalli Ma'am, who uh, spoke about the difficulties of uh, being a small town governor and also a small town mayor, and, and particularly in the context of uh, lack of capacities, lack of financial uh, um, resources. Um, and, and, and a lot more of, of the struggles of um, um, not being able to run um, uh, the municipal governance with any degree of confidence and authority that, that can actually be um, delivering what people need. Um, and then um, Mr. Bikash Ranjan Bhattacharya, who is the ex-mayor of Calcutta and the current Rajya Sabha member, was beginning to talk about uh, uh, his own understanding of uh, why uh, the, the cities that we have now are not working very well, uh, which brings me back to the original question with which we started this whole conversation, which is that uh, uh, what is our diagnosis of why cities are not delivering what we expect them to deliver? Um, and what is our prescription? And, and obviously, the, the, the question then would fold in a number of uh, premises, which is about, uh, are we really expecting our cities to do too much? Um, are we putting in too much money in them? Um, is it possible that uh, each city, given its own specific location in a region, has a different trajectory? Are there common paths between them? Uh, what are the institutional challenges? All of these kinds of questions. So with that very quick summary, um, um, we will move on to your presentation um, based on your experience. And we're really hoping to learn from you. Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Anand. Um, how much time uh, do I have to present? About uh, 15 minutes. OK. So I had already mailed my presentation uh, to your office and uh, Radhika, can you can you get that presentation up? Otherwise, I can do it from my screen. Yeah, now she's doing it. Okay, so with your uh, kind permission, I would like to start, and uh, I, I myself opted for this topic uh, because all along I have felt, you know, after uh, my long stint in the Chennai Municipal Corporation as commissioner, I've been an you know, member secretary of the Chennai Metropolitan Development Agency. Um, I've been a deputy commissioner earlier. I've been in this urban space for quite some time and watched from different angles. And I felt 
I, I've seen this discussion happening for several years, if not decades. And I, I ultimately felt that the most important thing that uh, we need to address before we take up these questions is to look at the institutional aspect. I'm happy that uh, your, your forum is today uh, providing the right direction. So we need to really address the governance issue from the institutional aspect. So which is why I titled my presentation as Getting the Institutions Right. May I move to the next slide, please? So um, I would like to start by saying that uh, we are all aware of the 74th uh, Constitutional Amendment. Um, but we are also aware of the fact that practically in all the states, the local bodies were set up under state specific legislations. Uh, in Tamil Nadu, for example, we had the District Municipalities Act of, I think, 1926. And then we had the uh, Madras uh, Corporation Act, uh, again, pre-independence, and later on it was amended. Uh, we also now have a separate act for each of the 10 municipal corporations other than Chennai. And uh, then the town panchayats uh, are there. And then you have the, of course, the rural panchayats. But the urban local bodies, which is our focus, were set up under state legislation well before this amendment took place. And seen in that context, you must realize that if you read the all these acts, all the impression that you get is that these local bodies are basically uh, subsidiaries to the state, they are instrumentalities of the state. It's only in the 74th Amendment that you know they have given, given a constitutional status as a, as a third tier, which, which enjoys, if not more, at least you know, certain equal powers in, in their own domain. And therefore, um, but still those acts uh, largely govern uh, the local bodies and therefore they continue to be seen as as uh, instrumentalities who are there to execute the mandate of the state. Um, by definition, most of these municipalities, if you see under the act, their functions largely relate to basic services like water supply, sewerage, storm, uh, solid waste management, roads, drainage, street lights, public health, primary education. Uh, of course, it may be plus or more in certain uh, states, but then by and large, these are the broad functions that they are expected to carry. And this has been there from time immemorial. The acts also provided that uh, these uh, local bodies could levy their own taxes, primarily property tax, and then later on, uh, proficient tax was added. Then they had other levies, non-tax levies. Um, the other major source, as you're well aware, is the devolution from the uh, state uh, based on the uh, recommendations of the Finance Commission. It also has a share in the state taxes uh, by law. Then it gets certain grants from the state government or the central government. And it is also uh, eligible for uh, borrowing uh, you know, from the market or from uh, financial institutions. So these are broad buckets in which funds come to the local bodies, which we are all well aware of. Um, of course, the uh, schema is such that you have to have elections every five years. So you have either ward council members or councillors as they're called. Uh, in, in the major corporations, the head of the council is the mayor. In smaller local bodies like municipalities, they are called chairpersons, if you are well aware. And we all know that there is a permanent executive, uh, employees of the local body. Uh, as well as there are deputationists from state government, typically at a senior level in the bureaucracy there. Uh, invariably, you may find in most of the states that the chief executive, normally called the commissioner, is an officer from a state cadre. It could be from the All India Services or a state service. And uh, <clears throat> there is also, I think, broadly, uh, the, the, the system, at least in Tamil Nadu, it is there that there are limits on the administrative and financial powers of these local bodies. And uh, these keep changing from time to time, but then there are limits. But I'm told there are states where the local bodies have unlimited powers. Next one, please. <clears throat> what I want to highlight today is that um, although these municipalities are tasked with a lot of uh, municipal functions, which I narrated a moment ago, but there are several services uh, that, uh, that impinge on the lives of people in these cities which are not performed by these uh, corporations or municipalities. 
and there are dedicated agencies to do. For example, the key task of urban planning, including preparation of master plan and the detailed development plans, are vested uh, with the state planning authority. In Tamil Nadu, for example, the uh, Chennai Metropolitan Development Agency for Chennai region and the director of town country planning for the rest of the state. So they are responsible for planning. Land administration and other typical revenue functions like civil supplies and social welfare continue to be with the district collector. The police are fairly independent of the mayor <laughs> or the council and they primarily look into law and order, crime and traffic management. The power supply, unlike in the uh, some countries in the uh, western part of the world, uh, the power supply uh, is strictly with the state government or with private discoms, but not with the local body. Uh, of course, there are exceptions within the country where the disc, uh, the, the discom function is proven by the local body, but by and large in India, power supply is with the state. Um, when it comes to drainage, uh, the macro drainage, which means the major rivers and canals, and the large water bodies, they are managed by the state public works department. Uh, at least in Tamil Nadu, that's the case. Um, when it comes to transportation issues, whether it is maintaining the highways or the transport agencies like the tra bus tra corporations or the metro rail or train, they are vested with the either state or the center. Pollution control is a major concern these days, and that is the concern of the pollution control board of the state. Water supply and sewerage used to traditionally be functions of these urban local bodies, but in several cities, including Chennai, these have been handed over to state parastatals, so specialized bodies under the state government and not reporting to the mayor and council. Um, the general economy and employment, job creation, these functions are uh, beyond the mandate of these local bodies in India. Unlike in the West, um, the, 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 there is no capacity or no mandate with the urban local bodies. And there are other specialized departments like industry, labor, finance, who actually uh, work under the state government to boost the economy and employment. Um, I mentioned that primary education and primary health care uh, in certain cities is with the local body, but higher education, secondary and tertiary health care usually best with the uh, state uh, education department. Next one, please. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, unlike in other parts of the world uh, where the general talk is about city governments, in India, cities are not city governments. They are basically governed by municipal bodies performing limited functions and are not city governments as are understood uh, elsewhere. Next. I just given an illustration. Uh, this could be any city, but since I worked in Chennai, one of the major issues that Chennai faces is uh, pollution in its rivers. In fact, it's a city which is blessed with as many as three rivers uh, going through it. Uh, and, and there is one major canal, the Buckingham Canal, and there is a huge marshland called Pallikarnai. These are huge water bodies, but they are all owned and maintained by the Public Works Department, and any pollution in them is monitored by the Pollution Control Board. The pollution everyone knows is largely on account of sewage that is let out into these rivers or canal. And it's most uh, probably due to the inefficient uh, sewerage system in the existing city, as well as the incomplete system because the city expanded its boundaries into uh, uh, peri-urban areas, into rural areas where there were no systems. And therefore all that pollution, uh, the sewage that is let out by those uh, areas is let out into these, ultimately find its way into these rivers. But the whole system of uh, whatever sewerage system that is existing is maintained by Chennai Metro Water and not by the Chennai Corporation. Whereas if you look at the micro drainage, the stormwater drains, these are maintained by the General Municipal Corporation. It is called GCC, Greater Chennai Corporation. And these are actually meant to carry only these the, the rainwater in normal times and not the wastewater. Whereas the actual situation is if you open up any drain in Chennai city, it invariably will have sewage from individual properties. And therefore these are perpetually choked leading to its own health issues. And regular upkeep of these stormwater drains is grossly affected because uh, a lot of 
these are crisscrossed by water connections and cables. And if you want to even open up a stormwater drain, there are uh, restrictions by police on maintenance works. As a result, most of these uh, stormwater drains are, are inefficient, are carriers of sewage and breed mosquitoes, which is a public health issue. There is also this issue of encroachments on public lands and water bodies, which contribute to the pollution. And, and the, uh, uh, the, the enforcement of uh, all these encroachments is vested with the state agencies who take very little action in removing these encroachments. And these also, uh, the, the slums that are on the banks of rivers or other encroachments, they let out sewage uh, that uh, pollutes these rivers. Um, there is also this issue that uh, the city has seen rapid urbanization over the past four or five decades. And it's also a fact that the planning authority, namely the CMBA, had been granting planning approvals in the past uh, without ensuring that there was adequate infrastructure like drainage or water supply or sewage in these areas. The idea was that the developer would provide these, uh, but the plan had a provision, but there was no infrastructure on ground. As a result, we still have colonies where you know uh, there are approved layouts, but they don't have you know, proper uh, sewage, for example, uh, systems. As a result, they all continue to pollute the ground or the river systems. And of course, then the resultant public health issues like uh, malaria and other vector-borne diseases, which are incidentally in the domain of the corporation, the GCC. So the issue is very complex. There are multiple agencies that impinge on this issue of pollution in Chennai's rivers, but it doesn't seem to be anybody's uh, sole responsibility. The Chennai Corporation tries its best to somehow control disease, control mosquitoes, control uh, pollution, but it's strapped because it doesn't have the mandate uh, because most of the other agencies uh, you know, have control on these assets. Next one. So to summarize then, there is no single agency to fix responsibility. If you were to say, why is there say malaria in Chennai or why, why are our rivers polluted? You can't fix responsibility on one agency. Uh, and, and therefore, I think this calls for serious introspection into our governance system. Next one, please. So if you look at what are the, what is ailing our governance structure in cities? Um, as I mentioned, um, you know, the, of course, you know, we have very limited kind of a, uh, a mandate as far as the corporation is concerned. But it's also a fact that whatever mandate we have, we don't deliver it. One reason is because the institution has limited capacity you look at the profile of the officials who are manning key positions in the Chennai Corporation or any local body for that matter, most of it is, uh, most of them are engineers or generalists, have uh, very low skill levels and awareness levels in public health uh, about environmental issues, about finance, about urban planning and a host of other issues. So to expect them to overnight become, you know, very sensitive and also experts in these fields uh, is at all order. Uh, my experience has been that most of these local bodies lack any systemic approach to issues. There's a lot of uh, ad hocism and one finds that they are always lurching from one crisis to another and there is really no time to sit back and look at a system and see how you can uh, improve upon it. Um, it's a well-known fact that these are hugely political bodies prone to interference at multiple levels, whether right from the mayor down to the councillors, then you have MLAs and other party functionaries who day in and day out you know, I mean, interfere in the functioning of officials. Uh, as far as the leadership is concerned on the executive side, the senior leadership right from commissioner to deputy commissioners and other senior officers are invariably deputationists uh, taken from the state government. And therefore, their loyalty obviously is to the state government. Um, <clears throat> as far as the mayor is concerned, um, he obviously has no say in the selection of the chief executive or even his next level officers. They are just deputed by the state and he has to accept uh, such officers, whatever be their competence. Um, what one, ex one, one can't escape the fact that uh, there is always a potential for conflict 
uh, between the state political leadership and the mayor, uh, basically because of uh, you know conflicting interests. And it becomes more acute if you know both are from uh, uh, on different sides of the political spectrum. I mean, I'm sure there are some mayors, honorable mayors, on this forum, and they would have spoken about it. But there is this always perpetual conflict, you know, between the state and the city at the political level. And the commissioner is in a very precarious situation because he or she, uh, being an officer of the state, obviously has loyalties there, but at the same time uh, is expected to serve the mayor and council. So it's a very delicate balancing act that the commissioner and other senior officers continuously perform. It's a very centralized position, at least in Tamil Nadu. Uh, and, and in fact, most of the powers are vested with the commissioner. And, and uh, invariably what happens is that the entire organizational culture is kind of determined by the individual who is in that position. So the moment there is a change of commissioner, immediately policies change, immediately the way things work change, the processes change, priorities change. This becomes very frustrating for the elected representatives, particularly the mayor and the council, who have a tenure of five years and they have to go back to the electorate. And if they cannot deliver in those five years, uh, I mean, it, it becomes very frustrating for the elected body because ultimately they depend on the commissioner and the executive uh, who have an uncertain tenure, who have uncertain loyalties. And therefore, it's always a, a very difficult uh, balancing act that uh, one finds happening uh, in, 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 in these orphan local bodies. Next one, please. Continuing on the theme of weaknesses, uh, I also would like to, of course, it was mentioned briefly by you that uh, these local bodies have limited powers, particularly financial, except in some states. Um, the general thing is that because the minister who is responsible for local government is accountable to the legislative assembly, even for municipal functions. So uh, he has a right to, he sees he has a right to give directions, to call for reports, review, and, and to be responsible for everything that goes wrong or could go wrong in a, in a local body. And therefore, because of this accountability issue, um, there is dual responsibility. On one side, you have the mayor and council who are accountable to their electorate. On the other, you have the Honorable Minister in charge of the portfolio, who is answerable to the legislature and of course to the public. Um, obviously, because the state is the big daddy, it has set up these corporations and municipalities through legislative action. So it continues to exercise huge influence and very often through executive orders and sometimes by legislation uh, on these local bodies. Uh, one uh, uh, can't escape the fact that there are frequent review of local body officials by state functionaries, whether it's the Honorable Minister or the Secretary of the Department, the Chief Secretary, everyone would like to review the uh, local body officials. In fact, half the time, uh, I remember, used to be spent only preparing, you know, review reports and uh, submitting them. The, but the subtext of these reviews is that we in the government know better and one can't trust the local bodies. And, uh, and therefore, any, any financial sanction above a particular limit has to come to me. Any policy decision beyond a particular limit has to come to me because I know better than the local bodies. I can't trust you. And you are like, you know, uh, kids who need to be tutored all the time. Sometimes it gave me the impression that perhaps this whole system has been set up basically to ensure that the local bodies remain completely dependent on the state, especially for funding. Uh, property tax revision has not happened for years together, and there could be no reason why it's been continuously being delayed. Possibly because you know, if you don't revise it, then you the, the, the local body is at the mercy of state uh, to fund its expenses, and therefore, you know, uh, it, it's it's like uh, designed to basically keep them subservient. Um, I also would admit that there is a general reluctance, not just in our state, but everywhere I found a reluctance of state across the country uh, to share powers with the local bodies or to add functions despite the 74th Amendment. In fact, in some cases I've seen where attempts were actually made, for example, in public health and education, very often the conversation at state level was, why should the local body 
continue to even do these functions. There is a state health department, there is a state education department. Let them take over the primary health centers. Let them take over the primary schools. Why should the local bodies even continue these functions? Let them be busy just cleaning up the roads or the garbage or the waste. So that's that's how you know the thought process in government is. Next one, please. <clears throat> Going forward. Um, these, these are some of uh, my, my thoughts which I would like to share and I, I always put a disclaimer that these are my personal thoughts, nothing to be taken as official policy of the government. As a, as a practitioner, after several years of uh, working in local bodies, this is some thoughts I would like to share because this is an academic forum. I said that these, the, the, the municipal legislation was actually from a period when towns were very simple to manage. About 100 years ago, we were very small local bodies, small populations, limited functions. So it was not unusual that for each and everything, you could go to the commissioner, get an order, or uh, get your grievance redressed. Today, it's a million times more complex, far more complex for one individual to manage. So we require new structures of governance, which, which the present law doesn't kind of provide for. For example, um, we need to now look to see whether all this multiplicity of agencies I talked about, whether it needs to now be given up and we need to strengthen these city councils and the mayors, empower them so that the various functions of different agencies could be vested with the city government. Which means all the issues I talked about, the subjects of planning, land, taxation, finance, even the control on natural resources like rivers, public transportation, um, law enforcement even, for example, Western societies, even the police reports, the head of the police force reports to the mayor. Maybe there is a time come that we can try out that model. You could even task them with uh, things like how to promote investment, industrialization, creation of jobs uh, to the city government. A lot of mayors across the world do it very proactively. It's only in India that this is totally out of the ambit of the local bodies. And public health and education must be under the control of the city government. When it comes to uh, the executive under the mayor and council, my personal view is that if the mayors are to be held responsible for governing the city, they need to have freedom in choosing their managers. And Maybe the time has come to create a cadre of professional city managers who, who are not generalists, who are professional city managers, who are trained to manage cities and allow mayors the freedom to recruit them according to their terms and conditions. And these managers should be accountable to them alone, not to the state government, as in the case of reputationists. Alternatively, if you can't go to that extent, at least some choice should be given to the mayors to choose which officials should be deputed to the city from the state. It happens all the time between the center and state governments. The state recommends certain names and the center chooses those people whom it wants to appoint. Likewise, why can't uh, the mayors you know, choose the officials whom they want uh, to head their organizations? And this is an interesting thought that I've always harbored. I've shared it on multiple occasions. Today, if you look at a citizen, he or she is represented by a number of public representatives, right from the ward councillor to the mayor, to the MLA, to the member of parliament. There are as many as four people who represent him or her. It is just a thought. Why do we need separate elections for ward councillors? Why can't we just have the MLA as being the ex officio councillor representing the electorate in the city council? As it is, like in Chennai, the MLAs and MPs are ex officio members of the council. But those 10, 15 MLAs are in addition to the 200 odd city councillors. I visited US, one of our sister cities, San Antonio. I found it's a city of about a million people and they had only about 15 councillors. I don't see any reason why we should have 100 or 200 councillors and that also competing with MLAs for the same space. We invariably had problems where both used to be competing on the same turf. So instead of that, why, why have a councillor, elected councillor? You're electing an MLA, let him or her represent you, both in the council as well as in the legislature. 
only the mayor could be directly elected by the city's voters because it's an executive uh, the office and perhaps you know people would like to elect a direct mayor next one please there is an interesting variance uh, to this thing you could alternatively consider no please go back to the previous one please go back to the previous one yeah this is an interesting thought again no please next one please uh, go to the next one yes stop it here please yeah this is another thought that i would like to leave you with why don't you make the city administration a department of the government as it is de facto the state government is controlling the city you make it like a department of the state government have a minister head that department designate the minister as a mayor as the mayor appointed by the chief minister so that at least you know uh, the state government feels that it is in full control of the city let all the mlas in the city's jurisdiction be ex officio councillors and the mayor should be appointed from one of them so that the city has a person who is an mla or an ex officio councillor from within them a small neat council of 10 15 people with a mayor from within them appointed by the chief minister so that it's virtually under the control of the state government but it's a designated government of the uh, department of the government let the commissioner continue to be deputed from the state government and made ex officio secretary to government so that he doesn't report to another secretary straight away he can move papers uh, to get orders of the minister other senior positions in the city administration again could be filled on deputation from other departments because you need those that expertise in planning public works finance transport and so on and so forth so get those people on board as as deputationists all the functions of the state government pertaining to the city should be transferred to the city administration virtually like a mini government having complete financial autonomy and having full administrative powers of course reporting to the minister who will be ex officio mayor and of course under the supervision of the chief minister no need for another tier and the government to report to this would obviously avoid any conflict between the state government and local body while ensuring because our main purpose is to ensure that this multiplicity of agencies goes away there is a single point of responsibility this way the state government would still be accountable to the city residents and to the legislature because there is only one representative which is the mla so this is one structure i thought about which would solve a lot of problems but would actually lead to an effective city government this is for discussion of course i'll go to the last slide now and just uh, my next one please so basically my my theme of my talk has been you need to fix the institutions first before you start talking of governance and talk of how to raise uh, finances and how to carry out other reforms but to do that you need a huge amount of political will because states need to shed powers in favor of these local bodies which state is will be willing to do that is a moot point in order to just start this experiment some state will have to take a first step and take up let's say a big city you know one of the largest metropolises you take it and try it out as a first step you have to have of course enabling legislation therefore because the erstwhile legislation is just not up to it so maybe we'll have to rewrite these acts to set up these city governments which are effectively city governments not just municipalities you'll have to redesign these organizational structure of these local governments as i discussed and because initially there could be problems in raising finance taxation and all provide liberal funding support say for initial 5 years or so so that they can start delivering and showing results and once they establish they will be on their own the mayors of these city governments in whatever model uh, i have discussed two of them should be given a status equal to a minister at state level very often one found the mayor would be a very senior politician but in the hierarchy of things he or she would be considered less than even the junior most minister so therefore we need to at least for the major cities make the minister the mayors empowered give them status of a minister at the state level perhaps they could even sit in cabinet meetings you know to give them that kind of uh, status and finally the actual executive you really need to work hard on identifying and 
training a new breed of city managers to man crucial positions. Now, states have cadres. They have a cadre of generalists. They have a cadre of engineers. They have a cadre of health officers. And these are all like deployed to various municipalities and corporations in a transferable mode. You may say that there is a breed already, but that cadre is not professional. It's not trained, as I mentioned. So we need to tie up with good institutions to actually retrain them, reorient them, and, and bring out professionalism in that year after year. And once you have that mass available, it will be easy for mayors to pick up uh, talent from the market. So that's all I had to say. Uh, I thank you. Uh, next slide, please. I think that would be my concluding sentence. So my take is you get the institutions right, your good governance will follow. Thank you for giving me this patient hearing. Over to you, Mr. Anand. Anand, are you on? Hello, Anand, sir. Uh, uh, Harshil, are you there? Uh. Yes, Radhika, yes. Yes, so I am calling Anand, sir. Uh, in the meanwhile, please uh, take over and continue the conversation. Sure. Uh, uh, Vikram, sir, a uh, fantastic presentation. I think uh, really bold suggestions, actually, as far as uh, the city uh, uh, urban governance system is concerned, the two alternative suggest suggestions that you gave. Uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, the other uh, main uh, 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 points that you uh, specifically focused uh, was on uh, multiplicity of agencies. And uh, uh, of course, the conflict between state leadership and uh, uh, the uh, uh, city administration and the uh, uh, political leadership at, in, at the city level. So uh, I would like uh, 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 Mr. Uh, uh, Bikas sir to uh, please come in uh, here and uh, <coughs> draw viewpoints as uh, uh, far as conflict between state leadership and uh, you know the political uh, functioning at the city level is concerned. Uh, from your experience, uh, what do you propose uh, uh, with this concerned uh, matter? And uh, from what uh, uh, Vikram sir had uh, uh, suggested uh, from the two uh, uh, alternative systems that he had suggested. So uh, could you please uh, uh, come in and uh, share your viewpoints on that? Harshal, I'm afraid uh, Vikram sir is also not here. Uh, okay, Mr. Uh, okay, uh, because maybe so, you can take a few questions. Right. Uh, so I think uh, we go on to certain questions. So we have a question from uh, Mr. Manish Thakre that uh, how to bring more women as elected representatives. Uh, planners, social workers, or officials as officials in the municipality, how to make sure the gender and child uh, budgeting and municipal governance is uh, prioritized as far as uh, municipal governance is concerned. Uh, I would like uh, Pushpavali ma'am to uh, please respond to that uh, as far as the role of uh, women elected representatives is concerned. Uh, how do we build their capacity and what kind of role uh, 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 difference we should look at? as far as this subject is concerned. As, yes. I, as I told you earlier, you know, <clears throat> the elected women representative or others main representatives also, we should have some training, training. Okay. Otherwise we will not be able to act, part, participate actively. I told you, you know, other agencies, outside agencies actively, they came and uh, gave training to us. Then so that we came to know how the budget should be, but how we should put, participate in the budget, how to uh, allocate the budget for the women and the, what is gender budget, everything we came from the outsources. But the main corporation, um, somebody may mistake me, please excuse me because the officers won't tell any 
think frankly to us because we can't fight with them straightly you know if we know everything in the administration so we need some i think we need some training to bring up the women rep representatives and also the party should concentrate to build them from the grassroots level is it okay right one that's interesting i think it's not only uh, capacity building trainings it's also uh, initiative from the party side that uh, build uh, uh, really good uh, 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 women uh, elected representatives uh, and uh, that is the other side to it uh, i think anand sir is back uh, anand sir i think what yes you... i am right uh, so can you hear me uh, capacity building of women elected representatives and uh, how how do you bring a uh, uh -huh. sensitization into uh, municipal governance and budget and so on yeah can you hear me now yes we can hear. we can hear you sure okay i must have said something really really terrible so i got kicked out something happened and it just disconnected me actually when i was kicked out i was saying that um uh, um Mr. Kapoor's presentation was very provocative. Um, in that, uh, it was really interesting as a thought experiment to see um, to what extent, you know, what kind of 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 legal uh, changes do we need to make to make this actually work, um, <clears throat> or are there actually ways in which this can be made made workable? within the framework that we already have so for example maybe i'm wondering because of the scale at which the suggestion seems to be most meaningful that is to have let's say the ex officio mlas of of a city being the the um, the the um, council members um, <clears throat> the city needs to be large enough right i mean the, the constituencies of mlas is very large so maybe one of the ways to think about this is to see if we can um, visualize the metropolitan planning committee within the uh, constitutional provision um, as one way of handling this because otherwise to 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 if if this requires a, a constitutional amendment afresh um this is not even going to be viable and thinkable in the coming 10 years but as an experiment to to see how this might work um uh, to keep the the uh the governing institution lean at the top and agile enough to to be able to act maybe one way to do it is to think it through the metropolitan planning committee because it does have all of these members as part of that already but uh i just want to open this up for further uh, reflections from from the from from the people who are here so i'm sure it's very 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 um provocative statements from mr kapoor um so i'm sure radhika do we have any questions from 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 people who are watching this yes sir we do have uh, harshil uh, i guess you can take over from here Uh, yes, uh, I think I would uh, suggest Kirti uh, Ji also to come in and uh, please uh, share his point of view and uh, the questions he has as far as uh, the presentation is concerned. Kirti Ji, if you would like to come in. Well, I think uh, this. Uh, I'm first. I must say I'm sorry. I think there were number of. Uh, Uh, problems we have, I think today, I think uh, Bikas Shah is not uh, able to come come in. Uh, Samili Jain, uh, Samila Jain is not uh, able to join. So I'm sorry. I think you know we are uh, at half strength more or less. But let me. But I think you know uh, 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 the terrific and very interesting uh, presentation from Vikram Kapoor Saab and of course Harshil and everything. i just wanted to ask two or three questions uh, uh uh to uh to vikram saab to begin with so the question is this that we like say uh, uh 
constitutional amendment happened something like 25, 26 years ago. And we know very well that it's not, it's not meant any major change in the way we manage our cities, the way we, way we govern them. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I think you know, the pressure on cities continues to mount. We are talking about something like 520 million people by 2030 and 840 million people by 2050. We are talking about urban cities essentially having doubled the population in the next 30 years. And if, if some kind of urgent action doesn't happen, don't you really think that you know, there'll be an enormous amount of chaos? And I think, you know, because cities' ability to kind of absorb these people and then create, you know, I think, a response in terms of infrastructure, jobs, and you know, employment and all that, it's, it's severely constrained. So my first question essentially is on that in terms of looking at the time element and the pressures, you know, which are there, uh, how does how does one manage how much how 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 does one uh, kind of bring about change to me that's very important and second one which is this that uh, when you look at the cities and uh, uh, we are going to have another webinar on a five trillion dollar economy uh, expectation we're talking about doubling I think you know uh, GDP uh, in five years time. So the question is this, that you know, if that were to happen, cities obviously will have to play a very, very big role. And the way they are, the way they function, the way they, they are structured, the way they are governed, is it really possible that they will be able to play that role? And the same, same thing I think applies when you talk about job creation. Uh, uh, we know that one of the major problems we have at this part of time, and I'm talking about nationally, not totally, I'm talking about urban areas at all. Job creation is a huge problem, and if job creation has to happen, cities and the urban sector will have to play a major role in that happening. Are cities equipped? If the cities are not equipped, what will happen to that particular challenge? So these are the kind of few questions that I had uh, anyone who wanted to kind of answer them uh, will be very happy. But I would very much uh, request that uh, Vikram sir, I think, take this up uh, because it's made a very, very interesting presentation. And of course, this is part of his thinking as well. Um, thank you, Kirti ji. Um, you've hit the nail on the head. I think uh, the challenge is enormous. If you're talking of a $5 trillion economy, there's no way it can happen uh, without uh, urban areas contributing to that growth because they are the engines of growth. In Tamil Nadu, it is estimated that 70% of the state uh, GDP comes from the urban areas. Yes. We are the largest, uh, you know, in terms of uh, urban, uh, as an urban state, more than 50% of our population is there. So about 70% 70, 70 of our economy is actually from the urban sector. So you can't ignore this sector any longer. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid, I think the policies in the past, you know, used to be that, you know, you need to promote the rural sector, you need to promote agriculture. Yes, that's important. But it was uh, invariably done at the, you know, a cost of uh, 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 neglecting the urban areas. So as a result, what happened was that the urban areas were allowed to just proliferate on their own without proper planning. This is what I mentioned when I talked about you know, the, the stress on infrastructure uh, that has happened because of unplanned growth. Uh, just to digress a bit, um, one of the outcomes, uh, I mean, one of the uh, tragedies that befell Chennai was in 2015, when we had the worst floods ever in the history of, uh, uh, of the state and the city. I was uh, the commissioner at that time, and I had the uh, you know, task of uh, providing relief to the public. It was a Herculean effort by everyone, uh, but it was a great eye-opener. A lot of people used to ask me, why did it happen? I don't have any answers. But over the course of the few years after that, 
there were several uh, experts who looked into it. And one of the things that they have all come around now to believing is that the, the, the region had an excellent system of drainage with hundreds and thousands of lakes and ponds and rivers and canals, which used to naturally impound water and the surplus used to go to the next and next and ultimately safely get into the uh, river. A lot of water used to percolate and add to the groundwater. Our ancestors knew the importance of water management. Unfortunately, in our mad rush to provide for growth, we kept on urbanizing uh, Chennai and its uh, the, the entire peripheral region, and so much so that the floodplains were built upon the local uh, the, the the canals and the water bodies were encroached upon, just in the name of providing housing and development. Uh, in the name of uh, providing office spaces and utilities, you took over every bit of land, which was earlier a natural sponge. It used to absorb water, it used to provide proper drainage. In addition to that, as I mentioned, uh, planning approvals were given right, left and center. Land use conversion happened from agriculture to industrial or uh, residential use. And to that extent, the infrastructure was missing because you didn't have funds, you didn't have that kind of capacity to provide that much infrastructure. So you left it for the future, for the local bodies to provide it. Local bodies didn't have the funds. Most of our development of our IT corridor and other you know, companies used to happen, not in Chennai city, but in the neighboring uh, village panchayat or a town panchayat, which had no funds to provide drainage or roads or sewage systems. So what happened was all this urbanization happened both in a planned and unplanned manner, but without looking at the repercussion it has on, on, let us say, crucial issues like water management or drainage or flood control, which is why that tragedy befell. So, of course, it's not this, it was a combination of factors, but this had a major role to play. And I don't blame one individual or one government or anybody. As a society, I think we neglected it in the past. Now, of course, the awareness is there, a lot of damage has been done, but perhaps now we can uh, avoid making those mistakes while we plan for the next leap towards the five trillion economy you talk about. Yes, we do need to create jobs. We need to have growth. We need to provide for that growth in terms of infrastructure, both social and other infrastructure. But then it has to be done, keeping in mind that you, you need to look at its impact on other aspects, on the environment, on, on, on pollution, on the quality of life, etc. So therefore, with hindsight, I think we need to plan better, but any amount of planning will go to naught if you don't have the agencies to implement those plans. This is the whole point of my argument that today your institutions are not designed to implement those plans even. I understand the problem that yes, I need to provide for proper drainage or for proper, proper waste management, but do I have the institution to do it? No, we've just been adding areas village after village, town after town, making these into huge agglomerations, but we don't have that capacity to, to, to handle uh, the growth. So unless you come out with a model which, now, for example, today, even on the statute books, every single estimate has to be approved by the commissioner. How can a commissioner do that? There will be the, the 10,000 crore budget. There will be some, a million different estimates. Everything has to land on the commissioner's table. It used to take six months for an estimate to reach his table. By the time he approves it and gives it, you know, the damage is done. So I think those structures have to give way to more decentralized uh, forms of government, more empowered uh, local bodies. For any estimate more than uh, some uh, five crore or some 10 crore, it has to go to government. It will take another three months to get approval or sanction. They'll raise all kinds of queries. It will come back. How do you provide if you know your hands are tied? And, and we are talking of 21st century institutions which are not even empowered. For each and every small thing, you have to run uh, like a kindergarten student to get your approvals you know, from somebody. That's not how modern cities are governed. Why are we feeling shy of taking a bold step? We want to compare ourselves with the New Yorks and Londons of the world, but we won't want to you know, take a, a hard decision. Fortunately, in the past uh, one decade, we have noticed, you know, so many uh, far-reaching reforms have happened, so much legislation has happened, very, very bold decisions have been taken, both at center and state government level. Why are we feeling shy 
of touching this particular uh, you know uh, the, the urban sector incremental reforms with all due regards sir will not help you need a major reform you need to take bold decisions try it out it may fail but at least try it take one city in every state a major city try out a reform where you really empower the city give them the resources give them the right talent give them the powers and then see whether they are able to you know deliver your growth story otherwise we will keep on discussing in these kind of seminars and keep writing papers but nothing is going to come out of it Yeah, sure. Sure. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Harshil, can I can I make a request? Uh, I have to leave now. Um, I have to rush to uh, right, some right. place where some of my friends are actually in a hospital. So, right. Um, yeah. So, will you be able to take over from here? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, Kirti Ji also could uh, uh, come in and. Uh, uh, yes. Questions? Yes. Yes, yes. I, I know I'm leaving it in great hands. <laughs> Kirti, I I have to leave now. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a lovely uh, conversation, Mr. Kapoor. I I hope I'll hear more about this in future. Um, yeah, I I was actually um, going to say that I was part of the team that worked with uh, Mr. K C Shivaram Krishnan in 2012 to to think through this whole problem of metropolitan governance. um and and it was it was a really really eye opening experience because we traveled to all the big cities and figured out trying to figure out what's what's going wrong so thank you very much uh, and and i hope that 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 the conversation will continue for a little longer anyway bye bye thank you thank you thank you uh, uh harshil and i must thank you i think you know for taking the responsibility it was a short notice and i'm yeah. very glad that you came in and i know you're very busy you are really kind of you know have a big event you know i think you know around the corner but you pulled out time and came and made this possible thank you very much uh, anand ji thank you very much thank you anand. thank you thank you to have it no, sorry uh, uh thank you uh harshil what is the time now how much time is available now oh, we have a, about uh, 20 uh, sorry 10 more minutes to uh, closing okay. please okay uh i just saw a request you know from dev sahaya mathi you know is it possible to bring him in uh uh uh, uh i i saw his request is it possible to bring him in radhika um uh, so we can do that but we still need to address the q and a uh, from the okay. uh, audiences so i leave if you sell bring him in okay 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 uh uh so kirti ji can i uh, take a question from the qa please and... please please yeah uh so uh we have this uh, question from uh, shilpi agarwal that uh, do we need separate cells uh, for jnnu arum amrut and other uh, central scheme uh, uh, or missions can't they be executed through the uh, city government itself Uh, uh through capacity building and so on so uh probably i'll start with uh, uh vikram sir and then i uh, want to uh bikash sir on this uh vikram sir would you like to uh, respond to this um <coughs> see um the cells that you are referring to perhaps are those which are located in the uh, central government ministry of uh, urban development which uh, have launched these flagship programs so they do need a cell to coordinate you know the scheme because it is implemented across the country and you know you need to give guidelines you need to collect reports and take policy decisions so you do need require a cell there likewise uh, at the state level uh, since they are invariably these schemes are implemented at multiple local body levels again at the state level you require a cell to coordinate all these efforts in a similar manner there is no harm in having these cells sometimes they do bring value because sometimes they can provide uh, crucial inputs they can provide some expert opinion which may be lacking at the local body level as i mentioned a lot of these urban local bodies don't have capacity please understand they are also human beings there they are Uh, engineers or health uh, professionals and all and to expect them to all of a sudden master a 
a new technology or a new idea will be difficult so they do require hand holding at times and these cells do play a crucial role in providing that hand holding so uh, yes these uh, schemes should be implemented at the city level but uh, these cells do play uh, an important role in hand holding and monitoring them thank you uh so because uh, uh, on these same lines uh, uh of central schemes if i'm not wrong i think kolkata uh, didn't have a, a jnnu arm scheme that was uh, uh, running or uh, they have they are not part of the smart city mission as well uh, if i'm not wrong so uh, because of this lack of central schemes i mean has there been an effect on uh, no, no, no. city so development factually you are not correct because while i was the mayor of the city of kolkata we had executed huge jnnuram project jnnuram project so one of the flagship project which has been internationally recognized and appreciated was the swaraj system the brick swaraj system which was there by the britishers laid down that was upgraded and regenerated by kolkata municipal corporation under the jnnuram scheme therefore the jnnuram scheme can be <coughs> implemented provided there is a good political understanding right and we had uh, shown it successfully that right. apart under the jnnu scheme we had really underground huge water connecting uh, tunnels were established for more than about 400 400 crores which right. supplies water filtered water to the city, to the residents and the wastage of water could be checked and controlled that these projects can be very well executed but i also agree that for effective execution there should be some expert cell who can coordinate better the coordination right. between three tier government is very important unless right. you have the proper coordination as i have said initially unless you make the constitutional scheme functional nothing would come out but if you can make it functional definitely the urban bodies at the third tier government can do a lot in many areas which have been mentioned by mr vikram kapoor i am not going to repeat that but these are the areas where local government can do effectively subject to of course devolution of power and the devolution of financial power not only the administrative power but the financial power where well, unfortunately our governments are little shaky and they feel shy of really distributing the finance which otherwise constitution provides right right also sir i would like to uh, pick you on one more aspect that uh, vikram sir had stressed on in his presentation which is uh, multiplicity of agencies and connecting it with uh, you know central missions like you have now the smart city mission which has a separate body uh, which is the special purpose vehicle uh, how do you view uh, uh, how do you view the scheme and how do you view uh, what is your viewpoint as far as multiplicity of agencies is concerned in uh, uh, from say kolkata so how... if multiplicity of agencies should be avoided yeah. there should be one coordinating agency who can pilot the programs right. and that can be properly executed i i would definitely agree that you always remove these administrative many heads bring it under a particular one scheme one window scheme which can be done through this uh, uh, smart city project and thereby you can execute it but the execution must be left with the governing independence of the local bodies otherwise you really ignore them and then you impose the center and the state on the local bodies at the compromise of their democratic independent functioning thereby surrendering the independence of third tier government that has to be carefully protected in my understanding right uh thank you because sir uh you think would you like to come in and uh, share some point of view or throw in more questions from your side well not uh, i i both uh, both to 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 vikram sir uh, and uh, uh, and vikram ji abhik ashab and and vikram ji i just wanted to ask questions sir i don't know whether you are aware but uh, uh, uh in the mid 80s there was this national commission on urbanization which was set up uh, by by rajiv gandhi government and uh, uh, i know radu well because i was one of those uh, member of the commission and that commission i think you know was was uh, had a three year tenure 
and it put together one of the most thoughtful ideas you know, about the future of this urban future of the country and it is how to go about doing it. Vikram uh, uh, sir, I think you know, you're, you're saying that an you know, issue is not so much new ideas, issues, implementation issues, putting in place institutional structure. What I wanted to ask you was this, that you know, that happened 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Countries, you know, urban problems are multiplied and, 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 and become much more complex. Do you see a need for some kind of, uh, uh, it, it was in a manner of speaking, some kind of think tank created of civil society and professional by, this, by the government. You really think, uh, uh, because you know, we've been working in that direction, uh, what, what do you think, uh, 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 Vikram Saab and, and of course, uh, uh, Bikash Saab, what do you think of an idea like this? Uh, Uh, maybe because you may like to answer this. <laughs> no, I think that's a good idea. You see, <clears throat> that's why the urban governance really speaks for formation of the ward committees, where the local residents, maybe intellectuals from different sectors, who would ultimately be benefited by the outcome of the project. Therefore, their active participation is very important. Therefore, the suggestion which has been put forward by you, I think is a well thought suggestion. Why should you not get the input from the, uh, the persons who would be ultimately be affected? Not only the city is not really only concerned of slum, the city is concerned of huge population, which is intellectuals are the part of it. Therefore, they have to also have some contribution for the development. Therefore, the consideration of creation of a think tank with the, uh, uh, with the eminent persons from different sphere of that area is a very important idea and that is reflected in the what committee's constitution. Vikram sir, I'll be very interested in, in your views on this. Vikram sir, is he on? We can see him, uh, Vikram sir. Okay, I think today is a today is a bad day. Uh, uh, sorry, Harshil, I, I, I just uh, uh, okay. to get my cable because I think I've run out of charge. Yeah, sorry. What was that? No, I just wanted to kind of hear your view on this whole idea of uh, both uh, the National Commission on Urbanization. As a matter of oh, fact, yeah, we yeah, also yeah. been talking about State Commission on Urbanization. Also, saying that you know, urbanization essentially the state subject. States are not very proactive on the urban issues. They essentially take all the instructions and projects you know, that come from the national government. And there is a whole great need to kind of activate states on the urban issues as well. And, 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 and state commission on urbanization as an instrument to kind of you know, think through and develop ideas, in fact, develop you know, appropriate institutions. How would, you, how would you respond to that? No, I, I fully endorse what you say and uh, definitely, uh, but in between, if you recall, there was this high power expert committee led by Dr. Uh, late uh, Dr. Ishar Aluwalia, which actually uh, came out with a, a very, very uh, voluminous report on, on uh, urbanization. Uh, I suggest those who have not read it to go through it. It also there is only there is only exclusively on infrastructure investment. On infrastructure and investment. What is talking about? I think urbanization as a yeah. whole. So so, uh, uh, but it did touch on certain issues, you know, like uh, on on governance issues, and uh, yes, there is a need for perhaps a commission like this. But somebody asked, you know, why why uh, the seventy fourth amendment has not been uh, properly. Um, Kind of been followed up and uh, empowerment happened the way it was to have done it's 20 25 years so i just replied saying that perhaps there is not enough uh, public pressure on on the elected uh, representatives to take it seriously mr bikashi would i think would give more uh, i think i i, I mean tell with you i mean one voice with you that the awareness of the people of the exercise of democratic governance and their participation was not fully appreciated and it was not really made them, I mean, uh, capable of understanding that you have the right to do so. That's why we don't find the what committees, which is one of the important part of it. 
once the ward committees are constituted, automatically the area people got in themselves involved with the development project and the basic interest of the development of the entire area. That is very important. I mean, what with you? Uh, one thing I just want to mention, Kirti ji, the way uh, urban development has uh, happened is is uh, been like uh, uh, driven by schemes like JNNURM. Uh, with its uh, huge grants and uh, um, all of a sudden local bodies, you know, which hardly used to have any funding were seeing this spot uh, of gold at the end of the tunnel kind of a thing. So there was this mad rush to uh, access scheme funds. Nothing wrong in that, but the way they went about, I mean, one of the conditions I remember was that you should have a, a city development plan and it should have been you know kind of uh, discussed with the public with the council and then uh, approved and then sent um, i don't want to name many cities but there are cities which prepared these plans in 15 days and, yes. and passed in one sitting uh, and and just to kind of uh, and it was accepted by the then government of the day and uh, funds were sanctioned under jnr because there was pressure even from above to quickly uh, utilize these funds so the pressure was there so nobody took all these things seriously now city planning preparing master plans detailed development plans city development plans is serious business it requires enormous amount of consultation discussion dissemination uh, it, it takes months, if not years, to do that. But here, you did it in 15 days, and, and uh, like a checkbox, and people didn't bother, and funds were given. How they were utilized, whether they have served any purpose, is, is a different debate. But this is how we take participation, public participation, you know, the seriousness with which we take. So it's more of a formality, uh, and we never, you know, we were just doing lip service to it. And I'm surprised that except for a few voices the people didn't kind of uh, raise a big issue about it that, uh, how come all this thing was done without proper consultation yeah ji so we have uh, uh, it's uh, crossed the uh, don't have a, only thing is that before we before we really conclude you know, i was just wondering if uh, bikash sharanjan saab i think you know who had a problem uh, of, of Wi-Fi, uh, and I think you know he was interrupted. I think in between, if you wanted to kind of complete his presentation because he could not, and he could take probably five minutes and 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 uh, and finish the presentation. Very sorry that you know there was this interruption. If you could, if you wanted to come back and and complete his presentation, uh, it will be only appropriate. Uh, Vikram Ranjan, sir, you're on mute. Uh, okay, okay. Then I think let's 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 wind up. Uh, 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 Harshil, hello. Yes, yes, Kirti ji. We can. Yeah, no, I think you now this. If uh, uh, if there are no any other important questions, uh, uh, we will we can we can we can we can uh, find up wind up the the discussion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We can end up the discussion, Kirti ji. Yes. But there are no other questions now. Uh, no, sir. Uh, we have pretty okay. much uh, answered most of the questions here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I think you know. Let me kind of uh, uh, thank everyone. I think you know for their presence. Uh, I must. I must apologize, and I think you know. very, very sorry that uh, uh, some of the people uh, like. Mayor of Kochi, Mrs. Jain couldn't join us, and um, I regret very much that we had difficulty. I think you know with uh, Vikas Rajan Sabs, you know I think you know technology not really working, and there have been number of disruptions. Also sorry that you know Anandji had to go a little earlier, so there have been uh, difficulties today. I think in running the, the the thing. Nevertheless, I think it's been very useful uh, webinar. Uh, 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 it was rich in content and lots of good ideas have come up. And uh, uh, I must thank uh, the people who made time available and came despite, I think, the other commitment. So uh, uh, 
thank you bikas ranjan bhattacharya sahab you, you know, for, i'm sorry i was interrupted <laughs> for making the time so thank you for giving uh, 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 thank you Push, Push, pushpa ji pushpa ji uh, 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 thank you very much i think you know for for coming in and i also right. thank you and i also thank you for giving me this opportunity no thank you very much that you came in i think we were very keen to have a relatively smaller city come in and i think you know you brought in a wonderful understanding of what is happening in mysore and what are the what are the areas and especially i think your emphasis on on training and capacity building and preparing people to 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 manage their uh, uh, cities well i think was something very well taken vikram sahab uh, uh, you could join little late but terrific you made a remarkable presentation uh, very rich in content very rich in analysis and of course you came up uh, with uh, with a prescription which i think will be discussed for a long time uh, harshil thank you very much you know for coming in and i think your presentation on uh, prajas work was very interesting thank you avinash for uh, coming in despite disappointment yesterday that your system didn't work and i couldn't make a presentation so thank you very much and uh, 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 i am also grateful to tikender who is not here who helped us very much in introducing people so thank you very much for your time uh, let me also tell you that uh, the next webinar which is 39th of the series vikram saab and uh, and because saab uh, let me tell you that you know we've been running this webinar series for a long time since june and uh, we have uh, and this all tied under one umbrella called rethinking indian cities and uh, uh, the next one which is 39th takes place after two weeks uh, on 8th january and that is on architecture profession and education in the context of unfolding urban challenges <laughs> and that we organized by nasa national association of students of architecture we are really asking our students to kind of you know see what they think about their education and what they think about the profession they are going to join soon and this will be moderated by architect prem chandrawalkar please join if you can we still have something like two weeks available and before uh, we wind up uh, let me thank my colleagues uh, at studio in half radhika vani shimul alika and nita for this very useful work behind the scene thank you very much for your time thank you very much for attending and once again sorry that there have been disruptions and and difficulties thank you thank you thank you very much uh, kirti ji